It is said that during the golden age of ancient Athens, Pericles was a politician next to none. Worshipped like an Olympian god by his followers, Pericles was known for his rationale, his wisdom, courage, and incorruptibility. Even Thucydides, who belonged to a rival oligarch family, was unable to resist Pericles' charms and write ill about him. Such was his impact on Athens' democracy that his death commenced a chain of events that set the son of Athens' hegemony on the rest of Greece, never to rise again. Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's find out what happened to ancient Greece after the death of Pericles. There are many theories about what may have brought Pericles' life to an abrupt end. Some blame the Athenian plague, some blame the death of his sons due to the plague a year ago in 430 BC, and some believe it was both. But one thing's for sure, whatever got him could not have happened at a worse time for the mighty Athens. At the time of Pericles' death, Athens was fighting two battles at the same time. The plague was raging inside the city walls, while bloodthirsty Spartans were biding their time outside waiting for Athens to open the doors and fight them face to face. Unfortunately, the man with all the answers to Athens' problems was dead. And to make it worse, he was also pretty much responsible for putting Athens in this soup. In the year 431 BC, Athens forged an alliance with Corsaira, another naval city that was at war with Spartan's Peloponnesian ally, Corinth. Sparta saw this decision by Athens as infringing the 30-year peace treaty between the two states and declared war on Athens. With Sparta leading the Peloponnesian League and Athens heading the Delian League, the entirety of Greece got involved. As Spartans sieged Athens, Pericles made a radical decision to not confront the Spartan troops in an open battle. Abandoning the ancient code of honor among Greek city-states, Pericles ordered the Athenian army to close the gates of the city and asked citizens and soldiers alike to wait out the siege. With unimpeded naval operations, Athens knew they could protract the conflict indefinitely, and once Spartans were exhausted, they would go back home. Athens was pretty much an impregnable fortress, and Spartans had no chance from the outside, while for Pericles, a stalemate was just as good as a victory. However, this calculating move had one flaw that even the wise Pericles did not see coming. The massive influx of refugees to the city caused a sudden and rapidly growing plague, and with nowhere to escape, the plague hit hoplites, citizens, and politicians alike. Pericles succumbed to the plague in 429 BC. By the winter of 427 BC, the Athenians had lost 4,400 hoplites and 300 cavalrymen, a quarter of the Athenian front line of defense to the disease. Things were worse on the political front, as there was no leader strong enough to replace Pericles and create the same magic of leadership again in these dire times of need. In addition to depriving Athens of its greatest leader, the plague was also responsible for a profound social deterioration that had far-reaching consequences for Athens and Greece. The Great Pestilence of 430 BC had a socio-political corollary. The first infestation despoiled human flesh. The second infestation devastated the system of norms and values requisite for civilized existence. With Pericles out of the picture and self-centered politicians too busy to cling to their power, the plague unleashed an anarchic spirit that consumed the entire city. Riots and lawlessness became common as Athens virtually threw aside the School of Hellas. Once Athens was a city proud of its heritage, now it was just counting its days towards inevitable destruction. Unlike Pericles, the leaders that followed him after his death were unable to challenge the voters with a vision of wisdom, grandeur, and calculated politics. Instead, these men, Cleophon, Hyperbolus, and Cleon cling to pandering to the demos and flattering the kingmakers to gain power. Now, the void in leadership created by the death of Pericles allowed Cleon to propagate himself as the champion of the people and savior of democracy. Unfortunately, there were not any strong contenders to challenge his populistic strategy. He was a rough and unpolished politician, but had a powerful voice and natural eloquence which helped him to woo the support of the population by speaking what they wanted to hear. Cleophon bought the support of his people. For example, despite the stress on treasury due to the Spartan siege, he increased the pay for jury work, helping the improvement of livelihood for many of the poor Athenians who were heavily affected by the war and the plague. Riding the wave of nationalism and hatred for Spartans, Cleon practiced sycophancy openly and removed anybody likely to endanger his position of power. 
Soon, what followed was perhaps the biggest military blunder in the Peloponnesian War. Another opportunist, Alcibiades, managed to convince Athens to ignore the ongoing threat of an unsubdued foe in the main theater of battle and recklessly open a second front in the west in 415 BC, the move that is now infamous as the Sicilian Expedition. The result was predictable. The Sicilian city-state of Syracuse became the Athenian Stalingrad, an unmitigated catastrophe from which Athens never recovered. But this could have been avoided nearly a decade ago when Cleon and Demosthenes had the chance to end the war with a peace treaty after securing Pylos and Sphacteria. Spartans offered peace terms to the Athenian leadership, but given those terms were against Cleon's promise to Athens' populace to decimate Sparta, the inflammatory orator spurred his warmongering rhetoric in the popular assembly of Athens against the treaty. He counterproposed terms that were onerous and downright humiliating to Spartans, virtually ensuring that hostilities between two alliances would not stop there. If Pericles was alive, this would have been the end of the Second Peloponnesian War, and he may have saved Athens. But instead, Cleon had to pay with his life for his immature politics. In an attempt to recapture Amphipolis, Cleon was terminated in the Battle of Amphipolis and his army was routed. The actions by Cleon and his successors continued to detriment the relationship between Athens and her allies. As a result, the continuous greed and poor leadership of these oligarchs did the job of weakening Athens for Spartans. The Athenian expedition in Sicily ended in a disastrous defeat and its generals were executed. Soon, Sparta found new allies in Persia and Rhodes. The Athenian leadership's poor strategy of keeping their allies out of decision-making pushed them to the brink of their patience, and when Sparta found a friend in Persia, Rhodes feared for their sovereignty. The Sicilian expedition also helped in shaking the confidence in Athens, and Rhodes knew it was time to either join Sparta on their terms or be invaded by Persia, which Athens would not be able to prevent. Under the leadership of Lysander, the Spartan campaign found new energy, and in four years, the Spartan general was able to bring Athens to its knees. Sparta couldn't risk letting Athens become strong again, so it demanded stringent concessions at the end of the Peloponnesian War. According to the terms of Athens' surrender to Lysander, the long walls and fortifications of the Piraeus were destroyed, the Athenian fleet was lost, exiles were recalled, and Sparta assumed command of Athens. Sparta imprisoned the chief leaders of Athens' democracy and nominated a body of 30 local men, the 30 tyrants, to rule Athens and frame a new oligarchic constitution. It is a mistake to think all Athenians were unhappy. Many in Athens favored oligarchy over democracy, surprisingly including Socrates, who supported Athens in the Second Peloponnesian War until the surrender. Some of the appointed tyrants were his own students. However, when these tyrants sought his support over some of the most radical judgments, Socrates refused to participate. He still didn't openly criticize such actions as the capture of Leon of Salamis. The Thirty Tyrants, under the leadership of Critias, appointed a council of 500 to serve the judicial functions, formerly belonging to all of the citizens. A police force was also appointed, and the rights to bear arms were stripped from almost all of the citizens of Athens, except for a total of 3,000. Their rule was as tyrannical as it could be, under the leadership of Thirty Tyrants, any Athenian citizen could be condemned without a trial. That resulted in mass executions of criminals and politicians opposing the new governing system alike. Effectively, all rights of Athenian citizens were rebuked. Under the new Spartan hegemony established in 404 BC, hundreds of Athenians were killed, thousands exiled, and the number of citizens were severely reduced until Athens' 30 tyrants were overthrown by an exiled Athenian general, Thrasybulus. Democracy was finally restored in Athens in 403 BC, but the days of glory of Athens were in the past now. Nearly three decades that followed the death of Pericles rattled the foundations of Athens, Sparta was unable to replace her as the dominant power in Greece for the long term. Sparta's imperialistic policies gained no favors from her allies, and soon they found themselves to be sympathetic to the Athenian cause. This led to the power struggle between Athens, Thebes, and Sparta. And though Athens came out on top, the century-long tug-of-war left all of Greece weak and brittle, ripe for Macedonia to swoop in. This leaves us wondering what civilization would have looked like if classic Athens would have survived longer along with its last great leader, Pericles. Tell us in the comments what do you think Athens could have accomplished? And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.